where are you, where are you from? <laughs> my answer is normally from many places. <laughs> After joining the military, you know, they, uh, I went to lots of different places throughout the world. And so I picked up lots of things from different countries. And some people say, you know, it's kind of hard to tell. It sounds like you might have an accent, but I can't tell where it's from. <laughs> I say, it's a mixture. Could be a mixture of Korean, Panamanian, or uh, uh, Vietnamese, or wherever, you know, wherever I go. You pick up a little bit from the people that you come in contact with and that you spend time with. Uh, I would consider, well, actually, it was two places, I suppose. Uh, growing up was Mississippi as a young child, and of course, Los Angeles area, Pasadena to be exact, uh, uh, in my teen years. So, I claim both, I suppose, as an area where I grew up. When, uh, oh man, it puts me at a really real grandpa, 1941. <laughs> I don't know many people born at 1941, but uh, that was my birth year, the year of uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. Very hot. Uh, uh, at that time, there was no uh, 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 discouragement of child labor. So at uh, uh, five, six years old, children were out in the field all day long in 100 plus degree weather, working along with their parents. You know? So it, it's, it, it was rough, but uh, we, we survived it. But to give you an answer what a sharecropper is, a sharecropper is, a, is one that uh, you don't own any land or anything, you work the land, and whatever the land produces is supposed to be split 50-50. But however, <laughs> uh, the plantation owners at that time, they didn't, I guess they kept books, but if they did, they didn't show it to the sharecropper. You know? They would just say at the end of the year, normally around the first week of December, uh, well, sorry, you come out in the hole, you didn't make any money, <laughs> so you still owe me some money. And because, you know, they would give you a small subsistence allowance during the months that you couldn't work. And either verbally, he'd say, okay, you made a couple hundred dollars, or, or you come out negative, but no actual figures were shown. So you just took the plantation owner's word for it, that this is the way it is, you know. And don't dare challenge him. <laughs> you say, okay, yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, Mom and Dad. Dad, I don't really remember too much about him. He passed away when I was uh, six years old. Uh, my mom, she became a single mom at that time, and. There were seven of us still in, in the home. The actual family was a, a, a nine, but two of the older sisters had married and left at that time. And so when she became a single mom, she had uh, seven, us, seven of us were still at home. And of course she uh, had someone that she could rely on because the kids ranged from 17 to, uh, to the oldest down to four years as the youngest. So the oldest one was able to read, write, and uh, you know help her with any kind of uh, financial decisions that she might need to make because her signature was an X. She'd write an X and that's all she could do. And so she needed someone to uh, be able to help her you know, and figure things out. So as the kids were stage one to 17, when she married and go away, there was another one, <laughs> all the way down. <laughs> so it worked out pretty good. <laughs> I remember that, yeah, I was the second to the, to, the, to the youngest. And we always shared things. So I went to school, I got this little uh, uh, book. And just a single little book, but it had all the, the uh, preschool working there and I looked around and there was one on the table and I kind of swiped it you know and I'm gonna take this home and give it to my sister <laughs> he raised the guy's name out in there he raised it out and wrote her name in there <laughs> uh, 
no one never knew the difference, I guess. They look, where's the book from? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, we, we like to share things. <laughs> uh, looking back in, in retrospect, I never should have done that. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I remember now, yeah. Uh, just a way of life. You know, the kids were to eat last. After the adults had eaten their food, then, okay, come on, kids, your time. But in my lifetime, with my kids and everything, I wanted them to eat first. And I would come last, you know. Or any guests that we may have, we feed the kids first. But, yeah, if I see people nowadays that... Uh, they do that to their kids. Go back now because they got company or something. It just doesn't sit well with me. Oh man, yes. at, at, at a nightclub. Night <laughs> nightclub and drinking. Uh, I didn't really like alcoholic beverages that detest the taste of alcohol. But you know, you take it and mix a little Coke with it or something, it wasn't that bad, but it never was, you know, a drinker. But in that particular picture, it was uh, at a club, people sitting around the table drinking, you know, alcoholic beverages as strong as they wanted them. Mine wasn't very strong, but, you know, it was social life. So it was in a club they called 5-4 Ballroom. <laughs> In Los Angeles, yeah. What about dancing? Um, when you hear this song, what do you think of? Honky Tonk? <laughs> yeah, it was a song that we spent a lot of time listening to and dancing to, yeah. And Bill Doggett and Honky Tonk, the year was 1957, I think. And this song was made popular. Well, I tried to join the military, um, probably to, I don't know, 15, 16. And we was in Mississippi at that time. And so the recruiter came in the car and put us in the back seat, said, we got to take a test. Couldn't pass the test. I said, oh, sorry, Charlie, but only the best tuna that becomes, <laughs> you know, a star kiss. <laughs> and so, uh, because my formal education was actually uh, the sixth grade, you know, halfway through the sixth grade, I didn't finish that. And so we went to Los Angeles, done odd jobs or whatever I could do, dishwasher and that sort of thing. And finally I got a letter from... The government said, Uncle Sam said, we need you. And in time of uh, uh, national emergencies, they don't care whether you can read, write, or whatever, as long as you can shoot a gun. So come on, we'll take you. <laughs> and so I was able to join the military. And after getting in, they said, no, no, you got to have a GED at least. Okay, well, they sent me to school a couple of times, enough to get the GED. Made rank pretty good. Every time I drew a rank, I got it. There's no, no hesitation. And then said, okay, now uh, your GT score is a little bit low. You need to go to school if you want to become a, an officer. Went back to school and raised the GT from, I think, somewhere in the 90s to 127. Passed the test. Said, okay, now you're promoted. Uh, to uh, from enlisted to officer status. One of the strangest things is, you know, when the soldiers get out and do the exercise PT, and they finish and they go back to the barracks and change clothes and get ready for the, the work day. And just so happened that I was walking in the opposite direction that they were walking. And now I got my officer bars on there, everyone. He just said, look. Uh, and they was just one time, but all of them passing me airport. I said, wait a minute, this is what an officer is all about. <laughs> and so it was kind of comical, but it didn't take me too long to get used to the change from enlisted to, to the officer status as a warrant officer. And then that's the uniform that you see there, the warrant officer a uniform. So I had a good career, you know, it lasted 24 years. 
and upon the uh, discharge, or actually retirement from the military. Then at four years of college, I can go and attend. This move. Transitioning from military back to uh, civilian life, I told you to get four years of college education. So I went to uh, Pierce College in Tacoma, Washington. I studied business administration. And that was a junior uh, college, uh, TCC. Uh, spent two years there with an AA degree in business administration. I only go four years, but they said, no, you cannot, your time is expired. And the, the GI Bill I was under, they said, you need to do it within 12 years. So I was on active duty, oh, well, sorry. And so I settled for two years, that's okay, I associate the group, but I probably would have gone more had the program not expired. Well, that was a beautiful uh, uh, assignment that I had in South Korea. I was there, I'd been promoted to a sergeant first class, and I was uh, had a, a, a what's called dining facilities for the soldier. It used to call it mess hall, but they said, no, no, that is not. We're going to change the name to, to dining facilities. So it was a dining facility manager. And I like to go over and above was required. And so one night I had a uh, candlelight dinner with steak and lobster in my dining facility. And it just so happened that the general's assistant was invited to come there and eat by the commander of my unit. And he saw this, hmm, so we need you for the commanding general's mess, which was actually like a little club for the commanding general. They had a, a movie, a dining room, a theater, uh, uh, and all this little thing. Then. And here I am, the manager, giving a, re a checkbook, here's your checkbook, buy whatever you want to support this. And so I had lots of uh, Korean people working for me, both men and women, you know, and the dining facility and the bar, and bartenders and uh, movie projectionists. And, and she was there. You know, so I think she was the most beautiful of all the things. <laughs> Somehow we just grew together. Yeah. Oh, we came to the U.S. Uh, 1976, uh, in November, I think it was. I think you were about four months old. Eh? My first, first child was about four months old at that time. Jungwon, he has such a kind heart, he'll help you anything that he can. And he doesn't feel bitter about the time that he was disconnected from the family. I tried to explain to him, you know, no, it's okay, that's done. You know, we won't talk about it. I'm part of the family now. And I looked at his application, and he puts his, where's your father born? Now, his father's Korean. But he put Ruville, Mississippi. He said, what? <laughs> So he's recognizing me as a father, rather than, you know, the one that's in, in Korea. So I was kind of impressed about that. But he has a lovely, lovely heart. He'll help you as much as he can. And of course, uh, 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 Linda, whoever she might be, <laughs> she has a, a kind heart also. And I just uh, uh, I really thank God that she loves our Lord and Savior as she does. And she follows him. I uh, pray daily that God would bless her. You know, she sacrificed so much for her kids. But I think somewhere, as the kids get a little older, God's got her made for her. Hmm? And she can, <laughs> she can come together and, 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 you know, the Bible says it's not good that a man should be alone. Well, it goes for the woman too. And my prayer is that uh, God will fulfill that before, you know, it's, it's too late. And she can still enjoy the camaraderie of, 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 a, of a husband, a godly husband. Uh, Robert, I just prayed for him. You know, I think he, uh, 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 what I 
like about him, he, he's sort of a, an independent guy. And work and you know do things that uh, look like he's doing on his own, but God is helping him. I don't think he realized how much God is helping him. You know, my parents said he would turn back to the Lord and realize that he's not doing these things on his own. But God is right there. Uh, it's got his back. As he said when he was in prison, he was broken, had nothing. But he prayed and received God as his Savior, and God delivered him. So my prayer is for Robert that he would turn back to the Father that uh, delivered him. The grandkids, they all fine. Uh, nice kids and everything. Uh, uh, Tony, I admire him. He got the courage to. Uh, Going to the Marine Corps, and he had the ability to convince his mom to let him go. You know, it's not easy for a mom to have a son, the only son, so to speak, to go into the Marine Corps because that's where they're the first ones into battle. So I just pray God would protect him. I'm going to give him some, a couple of Bibles before he leave, and I just hope for that he would. Uh, I'm also going to try to. Make sure that he understand what it take, what it means to be saved, and to have God as you, as your Lord and Savior before he leaves. So she's independent. I love her for how she uh, get out and work, and she understands. You know, you can't uh, rely on mom and dad, but she's trying to make her own way. I understand she studied in a medic, some kind, something in the medical field at South Puget Sound. And Asia, and she's kind of independent too, like Sue. I, I like that. But my prayer for her is that she won't go to this uh, secular school and let them turn her away from God. Continue to you know to be who she is. She was saved and baptized, but uh, the danger of people going to school and trying to fit in with teachers and peers, and sometimes. Uh, you know, they kind of lose their way temporarily. But I'm praying that, and I know that the Bible says, if you bring a child up in the admonition of God when they're old, they won't turn away from it. And I know that you brought her up, you know, in the church, you know, teaching the right things. Uh, little Indy, uh, I love about her, she's a, a, a talented. She can play music just by, by ear. She hear it and boom, boom, next thing you know, she's playing it. Uh, but again, the same prayer for her that God would just protect her and keep her uh, uh, while she's in school. Because as she progressed going through school, the world is becoming more wicked in many places. The school, the workplace, the shopping places. So I just pray that the Holy Spirit would just continue to be with her. And I want to witness to her too. She's almost 12 years old, and I think it's time that she have a personal relationship with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A writer was the last uh, uh, grandchild that was born. And of all the grandchild, grandchildren that we got, I say he is the, he is the end of the, uh, he's the caboose, I should say, of, of the train. <laughs> And so my prayer for Ryder is that he would uh, uh, grow up to be a strong Christian young man. Uh, he's very energetic and he's very smart. And I just hope that that would uh, continue throughout his uh, academic years and that he would uh, choose a profession that he would uh, be able to make a decent living, but most importantly, one that would honor God. My prayer for him is though that he would uh, 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 continue his studies. He's been getting A's and B's and all that sort of thing, and he's really a good student. So, right, are you just hanging there? God will protect you and, and see that you grow up to be the young man that you have the potential to be. But my grandpa wishes that you would get involved in martial arts, which you hate. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know whether it's the exercise or the discipline or whatever, but. Uh, I'd like to see you into martial arts. Just know that you could protect yourself in case you need it too.
Mm, I would have to say hands down would be Panama and uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, they're such lovely places. The waters are so crystal. Uh, look like kind of a greenish blue. You could, I could just spend all day on the beach. <laughs> You know, but the people I found there to be nice and friendly in both places, you know. Uh, Panama was my first duty station after I finished basic, basic training. And, uh, I always have uh, warm memories of the things and, and the friends that I met there, as well as later on in uh, uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and uh, St. Uh, Thomas, Virgin Islands. Uh, most part of it, I, uh, I've written many sermons on oh, different subjects and different things, uh, but the ones that I'm most proud of, and if you go over to First Baptist Church and you ask, well, what are some of the uh, sermons that you stand out that uh, Brother Bob preached? They're going to give you two out of many. But number one would be the waiting room, and number two would be the pizza box. And they, they, every time I go over there, they say, hey, they remind me of those too. And of course, I'm uh, proud of the accomplishment of uh, being able to convert from enlisted to uh, military, and the military to an officer status. And also the uh, accomplishment of Marrying a beautiful wife, a good wife, and the kids that she produced, you know. I, I look around and I'm pretty proud of that. You know, each and every one of them, even the grandkids. Oh, <laughs> nice suit. Huh? I think probably the guy I'm, I'm remembering is running was, he, uh, had a job over here with say works work source and they told him he needed to be there in a few minutes and nobody would pick him up so I picked him up and took him there. I don't know if that's the same one but uh, sometimes you see people you know uh, the spirit just tell you pick this person up because you know nowadays uh, you, you don't know who you're picking up but if you follow this, the Holy Spirit's guidance it will guide you to who you should help and you know, who you who you should not. You know. So this guy he got that just in time <laughs> to to get that particular job. You know. But the whole purpose here of this uh, deal is, I, I'm in my sunset years. You know, you she look around, the wife says, ah, you don't know what's going on, but I know that I'm in my sunset years. Sooner or later, I'm going to go home to be with the Lord. I wanted to have something that I could share with the uh, with the congregation in a church setting, not necessarily a church setting, but even in a house. If I could take a video and send to some relatives in Alabama or Florida or wherever and say, okay, if you see in this, that means that I've passed on. And I don't believe in people traveling a long distance uh, just to, I know it's not for the dead, but it's for the, for the living to come together and have closure. <clears throat> but I'm saying if they could look at a video and say, oh, yeah, 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 okay. And we could say, and they could say farewell, and then that closure could be there. Instead of people traveling long distances and spending money in hotels, for what? <laughs> when it could be done, you know, digitally so to speak. But I did want to say uh, to the people, whether it be uh, in their homes, and even if she says, it's not up to you, not up to you, you can't, you, you at the conversation, you can't do your own funeral, and, uh, I'm going to do what I want to do. And that's true, she, I'm gone, what can I do? I'm dead. <laughs> if she wants to have a funeral, invite all the people to come, that's up to her. Yeah. But uh, know this, my desire is to make things simple. But I would like to say to anybody that is watching it come, that someday you too is going to have to depart this world. Now God, 
He's blessed us. But someday that's all going to come to an end. And when your time come, how are you going to feel knowing that you're on your way out? Do you know for sure that you are a child of God and that he's your father? I just explained in my testimony, I, I didn't know. But I was working in the church, helping the pastor baptize people and bring them down. He, and when I told the pastor, he says, I want to be baptized. He said, what? I said, I'm not sure, but I'm sure now. I want to be baptized again because I believe that there is a God and he's coming to my heart to be my Lord and my Savior. And the two pastors that I told about they had the suits and, and all that stuff, they looked, oh, give him a Bible. And I believe he got a little bit of it now. <laughs> and so, you know, but you know, he, he preached a sermon, just give him a Bible. But people can live their lives in a waiting room situation. You know, in the waiting room, you go in there and you wait for your mode of transportation. Whether it's going to be an airplane, a train, or a bus, they provide a waiting room for you to wait there. But now, what we do as people, we go into this waiting room, which is life, and our, 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 our homes and things where we live, and we try to make that into something beautiful and spend all of our time and resources. What sense does that make to try to make a waiting room beautiful and comfortable, knowing that you're not going to stay there? Knowing that when the vehicle comes, whether it be an airplane or train or whatever, you're leaving that. But you spend all your time in this waiting room. Okay, look, I've got to go out and, and spend some money to make this look better. I've got to clean it, I've got to do this all for the waiting room. The waiting room is not your home. You're just passing through. Act like your home, eternal home, is to be home with God. But when your time comes to stand before Him, and you spend all this time on earthly things in your waiting room that you knew was not your home, rather than he can say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, what is he going to say to you? But you've had your good things on earth. Now, look at Lazarus, when he entered into Abraham's bosom. What happened to the rich man? There was one that built many barns. And I'm going to tear down this barn and build a bigger barn because I've got plenty of goods. Then I'll drink and I'll eat and I'll be happy. But God said, you fool! Your soul should be required of you this day. Then who will get you goods? The same thing goes to for a person that's in your waiting room trying to build it up, make it pretty. But when you go to eternity, who is going to get you goods? Something that you worked and spent your whole life for. You gotta leave it. When they take you in that hearse and go into the, into the graveyard, there's no U-Haul trailer behind it. Everything that you got of you coming, uh, uh, coming, accomplished in life will be lost. The Bible says, forgiveness is available for all. Christ died that we may be free. He was sinless, but he went to the grave to pay for our sins. So forgiveness is available for all that seek it. Available if you would come to him with a contrite and broken heart. But if you just come and you not really, people sometimes come to God seeking God, but they're not really sorrowful, they're not broken. They just come and, well, if he set me, okay, I'll uh, come as I is. But no, no. God wants you to come with a repentance heart. Repent means to turn, make a U turn. Turn from sin and turn to wake towards God.
That's repentance. You just can't say, Lord, I did this. I'm sorry. No, no, no. And go and do the same thing again. That's not repenting. Impossible. It's impossible for God to allow anyone to heaven that's full of sin. It's just not going to happen. If you come to him just as you are, even though you're sinful, if you come with a repentant heart and repent and turn away, he can clean you up and make you whiter than snow. But you must turn from sin and turn towards God. Heaven is the place where God says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, that you may be also. But you can't walk the fence. The Bible says if you love the world, you're an enemy of God. You've got to choose ye this day whom you will serve. Will it be the world? Or are you going to try to please Jesus? The Bible says you can't be greedy for money. You can't be greedy for gain. But Paul said the things that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, I do. So you just can't say, well, I'm going to change. I'm not going to be greedy for money. You can't change yourself. It's a process. You've got to go and ask God to forgive me and walk daily in Him. And pretty soon you will be clean a little at a time. It's just not all you bad things are gone. The old man that's still in you will be in you until the day you die. He said, the one that you feed the most, whether it be the flesh or the spirit, is the one that's going to control. So this day I say to you, be you ready, be prepared. In your waiting room, make sure that your ticket is valid, that when the train comes, you will be able to get on board and go to glory, to be with that Lord and Savior, who is Jesus Christ. I say I didn't grow up in a in a Christian home, so to speak. But uh, after getting married and traveling around, I met my wife, and she wasn't a Christian person. But she said she saw my brother, who was a minister, how his family and everything would work together, and how he interact with them, and it's something that she wanted. She said, I want my family to be like that. So she went to church and, you know, uh, she started meeting with people at the church and, and she got saved and baptized. And then she started talking to me, well, let's go to church, let's go to church. I said, well, wait a minute now, that's a Sunday, this is my day off. This is a day for me to relax, you go. And finally she kept on, okay, I'll go. And I went down and listen to the message and, and everything, well, that's fine, you know. Uh, that's what you want to do, you go. And she finally talked to the, the chaplain and come to the house. After, you know, several months that she'd been going. And he said, start asking questions. Bob, you believe uh, there's a, 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 a God? Yeah, I believe that. He, he started asking a lot of questions. I believed the things that he was saying. But just that I didn't feel no urgency, you know, to participate. I finally got to the point where he said, okay, if you believe, if you repeat after me these words, you know, and the things that you find in Roman, if, if you, you know, call on the Lord, name of the Lord, you shall be saved, and, and, and that sort of thing. That's, yeah, okay, repeat after me. I repeated everything after him. And then he asked me to repeat but I didn't see any changes in my life. And if you don't see any changes, you don't feel any difference, what happened? <laughs> yeah. And so it went probably, oh, many years that way. You know, I 
growing a little at a time, but you know, we, no, no major changes. Finally, we got here from uh, Puerto Rico, and that's where the, you know, the chaplain was. And they had a revival here at Temple Baptist Church down on College Street. And they invited two ministers to come to participate in the revival. Uh, each one of them had a doctor's uh, degree in, uh, in, in divinity, doctor of divinity. So. And so there was one guy. He come from Texas somewhere. Nobody invited him. He just showed up. A wrinkled suit on and everything. He was sleeping and, and, and he showed up. The two guys that had the doctor's degree, they said, okay, we're going to let the church come on now. Let's raise some money. We'll put them in the hotel. And they each got the hotel room. The guy with the wrinkled suit said, who will take him home? Well, I just retired, not doing anything during the day. I'll, I'll take him home. And so I took him home, and mom going to work, and you guys going to school and everything. And said, so he got to talk and said, now, are you, are you sure that you know that you're saved? And asking questions, you know. If you died today, you, what do you think would happen to you? And some of the questions, oh, I, didn't, I couldn't answer. <laughs> and so he said, okay, now, uh, I'm going to pray for your salvation, but I want you to ask God to come into your life and be your savior and forgive you of your sins and so on. And I could hear him praying, Lord, save this man. And I was praying myself, Lord, help me. I want to be, I want to be a Christian. I want to be a better person. Forgive me of my sins. So we were both praying, but he didn't come with a repeat after me. And you just repeat after him. He didn't do that. And during the prayer, it felt like an invis invisible hand that went into my chest without even opening it up and went that way, squeezed out all of the iniquities. Now, he was crying, I was crying, and said, Lord, thank you, Jesus. You know, but it was a great difference of repeat up to me. This is why even today I've been witnessing somebody, I don't want to try to lead them to the Lord by repeat up to me. Realize that you're a sinner. You ask him to come into your life. You know, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now, I'm going to say, oh, <laughs> how, how does that fit the, the, the situation when I say, Okay, uh, he's knocking at the door of your heart, and I'm going to open up <laughs> my door? You got to ask. This is my feelings. You know, the person that wants to be saved, ask. And you will come in, you will by no means cast you out. So that's how uh, uh, I know that I know that I'm a child of God.